It's nefarious, man. Like the brain works in fucked up ways. The mind is one of the most deceiving, manipulative pieces of equipment, flesh, human bodies on earth. I never have trusted my brain. All of that weight lives in our head. And you are the decision maker. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Hi, it's Ronsley. If this is your first volume, welcome. This is a weekly series where I go inside the mind of an entrepreneur, artist, athlete, academic to decipher what is the psychology of our decisions. As I script this volume, I'm in sunny Orlando, Florida, speaking at a conference called PodFest. And while my presentation is still not ready, this seems more important to get done. This show was created to push the boundaries of what is possible when representing a brand. How could we take long form interviews and put it together in a way that's easily consumable? I fail to understand the lack of editing in the podcasting world. You would never read a book that wasn't edited. You would never read a blog post for that matter that wasn't edited. Why would you listen to a podcast that isn't edited? And just like book editors, if you can't tell the good ones from the bad ones, then something is wrong. At Must Amplify, we specialize in giving businesses and brands a voice and making sure that that voice is heard by the right people. But introductions, they are hard. I started telling people five years ago that they needed to start a podcast. That changed to, you need to storytell using a podcast, which changed to, you know how every conversion in your business happens in a conversation, when whether you get new people on board, new clients, new partners, new sponsors. Well, we harness the power of those conversations to create content for your brand. Introductions, when we get older, are always hard. As Kevin Barlow explains in his TEDx talk, which has over 2.3 million views. Thank you. Hello. My name is Kevin Baylor, and I'm the grant writer for the Allentown Symphony Association. <clears throat> and I always find that a strange way to introduce myself. It's not that I don't like my job. I'm very proud of it. But why is that our only introduction? When I was five, I had lots of introductions. Hi, my name is Kevin, and my favorite color is green. Hi, my name is Kevin, and I have a cat named Tiger. Hi, my name is Kevin, and I love finger painting. Today, we are going inside the mind of James Whitaker, film producer, keynote speaker, author of multiple books, who has been interviewed on over 250 shows and endorsed by Bob Proctor and Barbara Corcoran. James, how do you introduce yourself at a barbecue? I feel like I've never had a great elevator pitch because I just... Being from Australia, but living over in America for the last seven years, I'm involved in projects like Think and Grow Rich. And I really hate the word rich because of the public sense of it. People think it's all about wealth when life, God, I just, money is such an, it's really the freedom that it enables you to create and being able to contribute to the causes you care about. That really is the primary function of wealth. Like money alone has absolutely no utility value. You can't eat coins or, or notes or anything like that. And I'm not a huge fan of people who go and buy things like Ferraris and, and Lamborghinis. So saying that I'm the producer of Thinking Grow Rich, the legacy or the author of Thinking Grow Rich, the legacy doesn't really uh, resonate with me because I would feel like a dick saying it. And if I felt like a dick saying it, I would certainly look like a dick um, to the people who were asking the question. So I, I, what I do at barbecues is I ask, I ask and I ask and I ask. And I just, I am really a lot more comfortable asking other people about what they're up to because I'm a huge believer knowing that I feel like we can learn so much about other people. And it's the foundational principle of relationships is that the number one most important topic in the world to people is themselves. So it's a, it's not, I'm not doing that in a selfish way to, to try and um, get them talking and not listening. I have developed the skill of being genuinely curious in other people. And I love hearing about other people's journeys and what they're passionate about rather than the traffic and the weather and things like that. But how I introduce myself 
it needs to be in a, a environment where I am comfortable in. If it's an environment where I know that what I do is not going to resonate with those people, I'm again, I just talk and I, I'm very, very uh, vague with what I say that I do. But if I'm in the right crowd of people who have an entrepreneurial background or um, close friends of friends, uh, then I will basically say that, yeah, I'm involved in a number of <laughs> a number of different things. I, uh, I help professionals and entrepreneurs find their passion or monetize their passion, um, an author and, and a speaker and things like that as well. One of the few defining factors of certain entrepreneurs is the dislike of being labeled, of being boxed into a corner. I, for one, am an Australian born in Bahrain and my mum is a Portuguese passport holder while my dad has an Indian one. English is my first language. I have professionally held titles of software engineer, software quality manager, financial advisor, chef, restauranter, DJ, author, CEO, speaker, and now podcaster. What box would you put me in if someone asked you about my heritage? What box would you put me in if someone asked you about my career? It's hard. I always have felt very, very uncomfortable with labels in any way, shape or form. I've always uh, massively resisted being put into a box. And I think that stemmed from a fear or a discomfort of people putting me in some type of hierarchy. And uh, that was something that was always very uncomfortable. And I was actually at a at an event two weeks after my uh, baby was born and they said, put up your hand if you're a father. And I looked around the room and a few seconds later, I went, oh my God, that's me. So I, uh, <laughs> I went to put my hand up uh, after that. But also the term entrepreneur, I feel like in Australia, it cops a very, very bad rap with the tall poppy syndrome. Um, I feel like in a country that's propped up massively by the financial services industry and the mining industries, that historically we haven't had a very good landscape uh, for entrepreneurs. And I know that's getting a hell of a lot better with all the awesome stuff you're doing and people we know together and things in Australia as well, which I absolutely love. In fact, there was a time a few years ago, I had entrepreneurs somewhere on my branding somewhere and, uh, and someone contacted me and said, just, you know, someone who was a friend and, and just said to me, uh, if I was you, I would take that down because in Australia, we think you're a dick if you have the word entrepreneur featured anywhere. So I've always been uncomfortable with that term, but over the last couple of years, I am very happy with that term and I, I sort of wear it like a badge of honor now. But if I had to pick one title, dad is, is the biggest one for me. In a heartwarming survey conducted by Zero to Three, an organization that trains and supports professionals and parents to improve the lives of infants and toddlers, Results found that 90% of fathers surveyed said that being a parent was their greatest joy, with 73% saying that their lives began when they became a dad. Hi, everybody. This Sunday's Father's Day, and so I want to take a moment to talk about the most important job many of us will ever have, and that's being a dad. Today, we're blessed to live in a world where technology allows us to connect instantly with just about anyone on the planet. But no matter how advanced we get, there will never be a substitute for the love and support, and most importantly, the presence of a parent in a child's life. And in many ways, that's uniquely true for fathers. I never really knew my own father. I was raised by a single mom and two wonderful grandparents who made incredible sacrifices for me. Today, we go inside the mind of an entrepreneur who considers his one title to be dad. How do you set up for the day? Well, even more important, what does your day look like, James? To basically run you through my entire daily routine, which is really so important to me, and again, gets thrown out if I'm traveling or, or as you know, people travel or, or have different things that go on, different life events. Uh, I like to wake up and have something fairly uh, healthy to eat. So often I actually start having uh, half a cucumber and a, a small coffee. And that for me is just a great way to reset. Uh, I'll do something like the five minute journal just to say, all right, what are the three most important things for me on this day? What am I grateful for? And what's a positive affirmation? I do that um, about 90% of the time. And I post that on Instagram and Facebook because I want to let people know that I, uh, that I walk the walk. I don't just talk the talk. And that to me is such an important foundation for the day. And then 
I need those morning hours to work. That to me means uh, if I don't get them in, I'm a lot more uh, unpleasant to be around for the rest of the day and just feel a lot more stressed. So I can lock myself in the room and have a three hour work block. Um, I don't need a break and I just feel hyper productive and, and get so much stuff done to the point that I feel like I have done as much in that three or four hour block uh, as someone else might have done with an eight hour block. Then I'll uh, relax and try and massively unwind. So what I like to do around lunchtime is have a healthy meal and then try and relax in a way that doesn't involve a screen because I feel like we have that mental fatigue if we're looking at screens all day because literally all my work revolves around uh, staring at a computer screen for the most part. Uh, then I'll try and do a, a gym session or some type of exercise about three or four days a week just to again reset after that. After In the afternoon time, it's very... Uh, I just feel very, very low on energy naturally, so I don't put too much pressure on myself. That's when I'll do something um, that doesn't require a great deal of brain power. So that's when I'll do things like respond to emails. And then in the afternoon, I'll have the quality time with the daughter. It's just her and I for about two and a half hours in the afternoon where it's really important to me just to have that time. And whether it's whether she's crying prolifically, which is rare because she's a very good baby thus far, it's just important that whatever it is, I feel it and I enjoy it and we have that time together. And then it's making sure we have a healthy dinner for my wife and I, or if she's making dinner, that's when I can then go and do another couple of hours of work. So all those different things, they don't involve for the most part, they don't involve junk food, they rarely involve alcohol unless I'm traveling um, or celebrating something as well. Um, these are the things that's really important for me to have my life in balance. Life balance. Seems like a myth. Seems like we humans want it all. Like life is one big sale and we have to get all the best bargains before our time is up. I've been working for long enough and uh, I've come across a lot of people, a lot of different uh, conversations, different countries. And there's people that have worked for me and some do still and some have moved on, obviously. But uh, there's a theme. I'm sure you're all aware, but there's this theme of work-life -life balance, right? So we're all struggling. Even the theme up here, you heard it. People are, it's going too fast. We can't keep up. We're dropping all these balls all the time. We feel like we're failing. If I spend time at home, then I'm not doing my work. If I spend time at work, I feel like a bad mom. If I spend time with my kids, then I can't be with my husband. If I'm with my husband, I can't work out. We can't win. Balance to make it all happen maybe comes from the desire to appear we can do it all. I realized recently that I've been saying this a lot while I walk around with a chocolate bar or a giant cookie. I can eat whatever I want these days. And I seem to get some satisfaction of being 20 kilograms lighter, which is 44 pounds, while I eat anything and everything I want. While the accepted norm is that you have to sacrifice either what you eat or how you exercise or how much you exercise to be able to reach weight loss goals. Someone really close even said to me, aren't you afraid you'll put all that weight on back again? Anyway, I digress. The point is we have beliefs in our brain. Those beliefs come from somewhere. And James' dad has written over 20 books and is an entrepreneurial legend. It was hard for me growing up uh, because I saw all the other cool dads, the ones who would go and they'd put, uh, you know, the, the cool radio stations like Triple M and B105, if you're from, uh, from Australia listening to this, they were all the, the great rock stations and just music that you wanted to listen to. And my dad would always put on things like classical music, which I couldn't stand, uh, and personal development tapes like Jim Rohn and Tony Robbins. And my God, it would do my head in which is so funny the way that life has panned out around these different things because I actually remember the content that was included on a lot of those tapes and listened to them by choice uh, now as well because they're all on Spotify. So I, I absolutely, uh, I love that. And I was also envious of the other kids whose dads were far more athletic than mine, wa uh, than mine was. So my dad would always, he would love going to play golf. So he would love hitting golf balls. He wasn't really keen to go and do things like kick the footy and pass the footy. And that's what I really, really wanted. Um, we played a bit of tennis and things as well. It was only when I 
got older that I realized I had a great dad and he was just great in different ways and those ways really shaped and formed the person who I become and, and basically the career that I have now forged and what I want to do for the rest of my life around helping people. So he really was the um, the blueprint for showing how to get to that level because he he grew up, he his father was a manager of a pig farm um, and his mom didn't have a job. So that very, very humble beginnings. He talks about a story in one of his books actually where his family went to a, a restaurant at the Gold Coast and they picked up the menus, a Chinese restaurant. They picked up the menus and realized they couldn't afford to eat there and had to leave. Now, that didn't happen to me, but I will never, ever, ever forget it. I feel like it happened to me and I remember that. And that's why my family who have had uh, success in, in varying degrees, always all of us feel a very strong sense of duty and obligation to give back to others. And that's how we want our lives to be evaluated on how we have been able to provide, uh, be of service and be of value to other people. And I guess the way that shapes my own um, role as being a father now, I feel like the biggest role that I have is to lead by example. And it's really important to me to make sure that I'm always smiling to Sophie, that she never sees us. She might see us having a bit of banter and and uh, not, not, not really arguments per se, but it's really important that we provide a platform of love for our family. So that uh, overwhelmingly, I feel like when I see people who are, who it's up to everyone to figure out what relationship they want. But when I hear of people cheating in relationships and things like that, they're not just cheating on their partner. I feel like they're cheating on their their children as well. And it's just so important to me that nothing else, if you had to, if you held a gun to my head and made me come up with a short list of what was most important in my life, everything else would go. And that role as a father, even more of the role of a husband would be the only thing that would be left. When we come back, building from the last few volumes on dealing with that inner voice and i don't enjoy the view at the top of the mountain for anything i just i i don't care so i would much rather give my energy to people who are believing in me who bring out the best in me and i bring out the best in them The main objective of this audio project is to bring together entrepreneurs and creatives who share similar values so that they can find the courage to put out their authentic voice for the right people to hear, which allows for them to make their impact on the world. Every great movement started with a memorable speech. For access to full-length interviews, go to psychologyofentrepreneurship.com and click the button. Before the break, the titles that matter and how to introduce yourself now for the stuff that happens inside all our brains and how to deal with that. Also, the pursuit of perfection. I don't enjoy the view at the top of the mountain for anything. I just, I, I don't care. I think even if I tried as much as I could, I just, it just, I don't care. Like if people say, oh, what's it like to have a book out? And that's fine. I have a book out, but that's not, I, I, uh, I might feel a, a sense of relief and satisfaction knowing that that project is completed because it then sets my sights on, well, what's the next way to make more of an impact and more of an impact and more of an impact. It's always looking forward. But I, I, do, love the, I do love the climb. I love that sense of urgency. If someone says, hey, I need this and I need it immediately, that's when I feel most comfortable in this chaos of that entrepreneurial life as a lot of people are. But the problem with that is it can create, it can lead to that imbalance in many, many other areas. So um, the whole perfection thing, it's striving towards that because it, it enables me to give the absolute best at everything that I have got. And that is what I absolutely love and what has been able to uh, create a lot of success as many other people would be able to define it externally by doing things like being a film producer and having two books out and another two books that will be released next year and, and different speaking engagements and other things as well. But how that manifests in the short term is extreme frustration for anything like that. If, if anything I feel is not absolutely perfect, like if I 
have a sip of coffee and it spills, if I, uh, if anything happens, like if I'm doing something when I'm cooking and it's not perfect, and I'm, I'm not Gordon Ramsay, uh, they, this, is, this is, as you said, especially where you don't have a measurable benchmark of what is success when you're hunting for perfection, I think it, it can make it even worse. Why do we set these unobtainable standards of perfection in a way that we can't measure it? And sometimes even having that measuring component can be bad because we feel a, a bad self uh, sense, self-esteem, a bad self-worth as we're doing these things. But whether I'm recording a – if you watch me as I'm recording a video series or a podcast, that's the times when you'll hear my uh, – you know, I'm swearing like a drunken sailor because I, I – it's not that I want it to be perfect, that I need it to be perfect. When experience has taught me that these are the things that no one would even pick up on anyway. I have these impossible standards for doing these things that people would not even notice that, that extra little bit of it anyway, but it doesn't stop me from doing it. And that's what creates that enormous sense of frustration and negative self-talk in the interim. So it's a way to get around that for me is being, first of all, being consciously aware of it. Okay, James, being aware is step one. What happens after that? What stuff do you look at more closely? A big part for me was making sure I, I look at everything. So what is the music that I'm listening to? What are the TV shows or movies I might be watching? What is around my environment? Is it untidy? I, I noticed that if I get back from traveling and I've got a a bag full of clothes or things on the floor or things all over my um, office desk, that that's the things that are going to flare me up the most. So that's why now we make sure everything is very, very clean because I feel like physical clutter can create the mental clutter. So having that reduced and eliminated and making sure I, I get out there outside to to feel the, the fresh air and the blue sky and trees and going out for a surf or a walk along the beach or a swim or a gym session, these are a hanging out with people who are good for you mentally rather than people who are just talking shit and don't really, um, you know, you can never hang around negative people and expect a positive outcome. So making sure you hang around people who have a common future, not a common past, because that was a big one for me, trying to pander to people who I just happened to have gone to high school with who haven't supported me in any way, shape or form, yet I felt a sense of wanting to make sure I put a lot of effort and energy into sustaining a relationship that might have died many years ago, but just for some reason I feel like still exists. I would much rather give my energy to people who are believing in me, who bring out the best in me and I bring out the best in them because I feel like that's what life's about. And you and I, all of our success is as a result of the relationships that we have had and not everyone is meant to be in your life forever. And it's important for us to, to look after ourselves primarily by giving to other people because that's the way that we get more back as well, which sounds selfish, but it's the, the best way that I feel like uh, human relationships flourish is if we give before we get. And importantly, we give without the expectation of getting anything back in return. Right, James. How does that all come back to being a speaker? Because they say that the biggest fear in the world is public speaking. Very, very, very comfortable on stage where growing up when I had enormous issues with anxiety to um, the point where I, in many cases, I would struggle to even be in a classroom or, or doing an important exam where it was, it seems so funny then for people to be like, oh, wow, you're speaking on a stage in front of a thousand people. And you not only have that sensory acuity of what's going on in the room, but you actually really enjoy it. That to me is something very, very uh, comfortable. And what I love right now, I'm, I really, really enjoy being on stage and it's sort of being the center of attention, but it's, it's more the, that addictive power of being able to command a room. It's such an addicting thing, I think, for, for most speakers when they get up on stage. It's a really powerful moment. In an inspirational quote by Richard Branson, he states, if you're an introvert and find it hard to communicate with strangers, then you have to practice, practice and practice, but practice being yourself. When you're first starting out, no one expects you to be a commanding leader or a world-class orator. You simply need to convey a sense of passion for what you're doing and they'll be hooked. Something that we started highlighting from the start is how much James prefers to listen rather than talk while I maybe feel the exact opposite to that. 
I really, really, really hate mobile phones and I, I especially hate the idea of pulling out a mobile phone with someone that I've just met to put them in one of 3,000 contacts where it would be impossible for me to remember um, a, a, you know, a little while later anyway. So I like the idea of having a business card that I can give them and them to give back to me because it's a tangible reminder that sits on my desk that I absolutely will follow up. And when people look at my business card, they're like, holy shit, that is the best business card that I've ever seen. I get that constantly. And if anyone might go on, it's easy now when we have these, these uh, I guess, social proof metrics that mean nothing to me, but they certainly mean a lot to other people. They might go and see like, oh, my, you've got a verified profile on Instagram or a verified profile on Facebook, or you've they might go and look at my website and see these testimonials that I've been on Success Magazine and all these different things around the world. Uh, I think that then makes it more powerful when they realize the humility up front because they might think, wow, this person had the opportunity to sit there and talk about um, themselves for a long, long time. They didn't. They asked about me and the struggles that I had and importantly, how um, he could help. And that is what I believe has been the foundation for all the relationships that have really been the backbone for every success that I have uh, right now. My favorite book of all time used to be The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. I have read slash listened to that book over 17 times. But the ego, well, it's the enemy. To me, as has been said many, many times, especially by the uh, hit or the biggest uh, best-selling book, Ego is the Enemy. I think Ryan Holiday, wasn't it? Like it's a, ego is the enemy. And the people I know in my life who are no longer in my life are the ones who are all about ego. And all the people in my life right now, my close circle are as far removed from ego as possible, yet they enjoy much more success. So I, whether I'm giving feedback or obtaining feedback now, although there's a part of you that wants that validation of just tell me that it's good so I can, so I can move on and have just a little bit of peace of mind in a chaotic world, which is the entrepreneur world, being able to provide feedback. I don't, I don't ever want to hear that something's good or that wow, that's great. I just, I never, ever, ever want to hear that. I would much rather have something that's far more constructive. And I'm, I'm very, very comfortable doing that at this International Book Buyers Conference that I spoke to in New York a couple of weeks ago. You had to sit there in a boardroom with the biggest book buyers on the entire planet from Target and Barnes and & Noble and Costco just hammer you about What's the deal with the title and when can we change the, the book cover and what about changing this, this, why is this included? And you're really thrown in the furnace, but I, I love that and I really, uh, I really felt alive in that moment. So I'm, I'm very comfortable now around obtaining that feedback, which I think is a level of emotional maturity on that entrepreneurial journey, which plagues people at the very, very early stages where they might think they have the world's best business idea, as anyone who's an entrepreneur thinks that at, at one point. I've thought that 50 times. And then I catch up with people, um, you know, very successful entrepreneurs or people like my brother who say, that's great, but how can you make money from it? Or they hit you with all these other questions. And before you know it, you're back to square one. But the people who are so protective of that business idea, they don't want to share it with others because they think, oh, well, I'm going to make them sign an NDA or they're going to steal my idea. They're the ones who either never bring a product to market in the first place or they bring a shitty product to market in the first place who is going to get run over by anyone else who has an advisory team or some type of, some type of mastermind group who has helped them develop that idea and flesh it out so they go to market with something amazing. That is emotional immaturity, I think, for the entrepreneurial journey. So that's the difference. I've just been involved in enough businesses and enough time and quite frankly, enough failures around doing those things to know that it's almost impossible now to have a completely revolutionary new idea, but obtaining that feedback and being able to facilitate an arena where you let people know that I don't want you to say it's good. I don't want you to say, do you like it? Yes. I want you to say, tell me three things that I can improve no matter what. Even if you think it's perfect, give me three things to improve. So anyone that I would obtain feedback from now about different business ideas or anything, that any pro new project that I'm involved in, it's very, very clear around what type of feedback that I want. And that's also the type of feedback that I endeavor to give to others. Feedback is a key component of any business. 
I recently spent January calling our old clients and current ones, asking them if I was to create Must Amplify 2.0, what would they want to be included and or changed and removed? That was hard because you aren't calling your ex-girlfriend saying, tell me how to improve because I want to get this marriage right. But uh, Mark Fisher in volume 19 pointed this out. This is not a joke. In the beginning of Mark Fisher Fitness, my business partner would hide critical feedback about me because he knew I was fragile and I would shatter on the ground like a Fabergé egg on the sidewalk because I was just so fragile. And now uh, I don't like it when someone says people things about me, but I think I'm a little bit better at like giving a little space uh, and then also asking, okay, well, what is true about this, right? So one of my favorite books, if anyone finds an issue that I, I have now read four times and we just had the whole team read is a book called thanks for the feedback go back and listen to volume 19 because mark breaks the book down for us and accepting feedback is hard because well social comparison theory there's a thing in psychology called social comparison theory that says if we don't have a worthy means of being able to evaluate our own uh presence in a community and in society that we will look for that validation externally. So the upward comparison by comparing ourselves to those who we believe are doing better than us, which might be things like a, a boyfriend or girlfriend they have or a car or a house or something like that. So we will say, I will be happy if, or I will be happy when. And then downward social comparison where we compare ourselves to those who we believe are doing worse than us. So being very comfortable in your own skin is really, really important. So that's what I like to let people know through everything that I do right now, that you need to be happy with wherever you're at right now. I've interviewed enough people, people who have been who have gone blind, people who have been hit by trucks, triple amputee, military veterans, you name it, I've interviewed them who have gone through the worst things that you could possibly imagine. It is absolutely possible to train yourself to be happy in the present and something like a gratitude practice is a good way to do that as well as all those other things like exercise, surrounding yourself with the right people, eating clean, all those different things. Psychology of entrepreneurship. Coming up on the psychology of entrepreneurship, you know, we, we as human beings, we, we are meant to, to go through life to learn. The funny thing is, I've never thought myself as anything else except the possibility of being an entrepreneur. Now I'm looking at all the stakeholders as so the stakeholders are not only the employees but the families of the employees psychology of entrepreneurship i interviewed james because he's one of the nicest people you'll meet he has been interviewed on some of the biggest media in the world including the today show entrepreneur magazine money magazine and the sydney morning herald his financial advising firm used to have over $2 billion under management. He is the producer of the film Think and Grow Rich, the movie. He's a keynote speaker, author, podcast host, film producer, entrepreneur, coach. And most importantly, a father, a husband, and a friend. This is a Must Amplify production. Special thanks to every guest expert that has appeared on the show. Editing and sound design by Tiago Vega. Voiceovers by Kelly Bonniman. Guest research and content by Claire Gould and Corinne Castles. Project managed by Shannon Morrison. Produced and hosted by me, Ronsley Valls. For more episodes and where to listen, go to mustamplify.com slash P-O-E. Hey. hey, it's Kaylee from Must Amplify. I'm the sound engineer for this volume of Psychology of Entrepreneurship. I'm part of the team that made this production come alive. I work as a part of a global team with our studios based in West End, Brisbane, Australia. 
If you would like a podcasting checklist, email me at kaylee at amplifyagency.media. That's K-A-I-L-I at amplifyagency.media. We specialize in finding your voice and making sure it's heard by the right people. If you are considering whether a podcast is a good idea for your business, check out our other show on shouldistartapodcast.com.